It, in this lecture, I'm talking about elasticity theory and giving an overview of elasticity theory, uh, the tensor uh, math needed to understand it. Then I talk about uh, homogeneous and inhomogeneous elasticity theory. The reason that elasticity theory is important is that it is directly related to bond stretching and bond bending where we've been talking about uh, bonding and describing bonds using you know, Madelung sums, using uh, sorry, Madelung energy, using uh, the uh, Leonard-Jones potentials. Uh, those are all parameterized uh, potentials. In order to connect real-world materials to these parameterized empirical models, we need to have a connection. And bond bending and bond stretching is certainly a way to do that. So it's possible to uh, take our knowledge of the elastic constants and uh, use those as a uh, primary means of determining the uh, parameters that go into our potentials. Other methods, of course, would involve, for example, the use of density functional theory. But again, that's going to be parameterizing an empirical potential based on a theoretical model. And we know that density functional theory and other quantum calculations tend to carry with them errors. And in the case of uh, looking at the curvature of energy versus volume, uh, except for the bulk modulus, you find errors that can be upwards of, you know, 25-30% depending on the exchange correlation used in the uh, exchange correlation approximation. The content that follows this was recorded last semester uh, as, as part of MSC 505, but uh, the content is very much applicable here uh, as it relates to the physical properties of solids and the bonding. So we're going to start by defining some terms. And finally, our terms, we're going to start out with these engineering strains, which we talked about last time. <coughs> right? So engineering strains, we would just have some beam length L that's being pulled to length L prime. So we've got some E is equal to L prime minus L over L. And then that's with some applied force. And then we talk about shear. terms of an angle and having gamma is equal to tan pi over 2 minus theta. Oh, sorry. Let me uh, define that a little bit differently. The way I defined it in these notes was uh, about these uh, rather in terms of infinitesimal strains. So what I want to do is I want to define a space. And my figure, right? I want to define a space that I'm going to call X1. 
one and x two. I'm changing notation from the undergrad notation to uh, what I call kind of a grown-up notation, in which we just number our, our directions. Uh, and in that, I want to have some point P, and P is going to be at x1, x2, and I want to have a point Q, which is infinitesimally close to point P. It doesn't look like it here. But Q is going to be defined as x1 plus dx1, x2 plus dx2. And if I take, and I have this be some uh, homogeneous, I said, well, some homogene homogeneous elastic body, and I apply a strain to it, P is going to move, and Q is going to move. P is going to move to P prime, and Q is going to move to Q prime. And I can define the displacement of P in terms of some u. So u is going to be our uh, elastic displacement. And u is going to be a function of position. So different points in this elastic body for a particular interaction is going to have a different amount of displacement. So this means that our P prime is now going to be x1 plus u1, x2 plus u2, and my q prime is going to be equal to x1 plus u1 plus dx1 plus du1, and x2 plus u2 plus dx2 plus du2. So we're simply saying that q's position is now its original position plus the amount of change at p plus the amount of change due to the change in infinitesimal change in position on board. Now, because u is a function of position, uh, we can use the chain rule to write these out as du1 is equal to the partial of u1 with respect to x1, dx1 plus the partial of u1 with respect to x2, sorry, x1, dx2, and du2 is equal to partial of u2 with respect to x1, dx1, plus the partial of u2 with respect to x2, dx2. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a very strong color. Uh, we're going to take each of these partial derivatives and we're going to define those as e i j is equal to 
partial of u in the i direction with respect to x sub j. And that allows us to rewrite that set of differential equations as d u i is equal to e i j d x j. So this using what's called Einstein notation. In which any time that you have on the same side of an equation, the same subscript showing up twice, so I'd say I've got a j there and a j there, this is actually d u i is equal to the sum over j equals 1 to, in this case, 2 e i j d x j or e i 1 d x 1 plus e i 2 d x 2. And this is nice because it's going to let us uh, save a lot on ink, uh, not to mention time. So what we've got here is we've got an expression uh, in which Now uh, a tensor E that describes the relationship between the displacements and the position. And now we can go back and, and we can look at this uh, and understand the components of the tensor a little more by uh, Rewriting our uh, kind of idealized shape. So let's take this out. systems. Let's pick point P and what I'm going to call Q1 to be directly in the X1 position. So that means the infinitesimal displacement between Q, so between P and Q1 uh, is dx1. So P is equal to x1, x2, q1 is equal to x1 plus dx1, and x2. And we'll pick a second point purely in the x2 direction, call that dq, I'm sorry, call that q2, makes that d x2, so we have q2 is equal to x1, x2 plus dx2. Now if we have this system and we allow some elastic interaction, 
that moves P to here, Q1. Q2, so P prime, Q1 prime, Q2 prime. So now P1, sorry, P prime is equal to X1 uh, plus U1, X2 plus U2, Q1. 1 prime is equal to x1 plus u1 plus dx1 plus du1 and x2 plus u2 plus du2. The dx1 is, uh, sorry, dx2 is absent uh, because there is no dx2 in the way we define that. And our Q2 prime, then similarly is X1 plus U1 plus DU2. Uh, comma, X2 plus U2 plus DX2 plus DU2. So in this one again, no DX1. And that allows us then to write our uh, displacement uh, differentials as du1 is equal to e11 dx1 du2 is equal to e21 dx1. That's for what's happening uh, in here. And for what's happening over here, we get, I should change colors. Well, right here anyhow. DU1 is equal to E12 DX2 and DU2 is equal to E22 dx2, sorry, this is 1. Yes, 2. Did I get that wrong? Oh, no mistake. That should be dx1, that should be dx2. Basically, uh, this and this are uniaxial extensions, and these two are rotation. We can talk about the tensor of E, our engineering strain, that relates displacement and position in terms of extension and rotation. Okay. Is that okay? expression and we're going to generalize this to 3D. The math is very similar except that now we have we now have a displacement vector u which is u1, u2, u3.
which means that if you have a position in space, position is equal to x1, x2, x3, that position changes to x prime, which is going to be x1 prime, x2 prime, and x3 prime. Okay, same math, we just added a, added a uh, term. Uh, and our displacement vectors, u, j, so the j component here is still just the difference between the new and the original coordinate. And this changes our tensor, or we're able to rewrite this as x1 prime is equal to 1 plus E11, X1 plus E12, X2 plus E13, X3, X2 prime is equal to E21, X1 plus 1 plus E22, X2 plus E2, 3, X3, and X3 prime is equal to E3, 1, X1 plus E3, 2, X2 plus 1 plus E3, 3, X3. So we can write them out this way. Now, the problem, though, is that, and we saw this, that when we have when we had our q two q one p and it changed, and I'll keep P constant, uh, but it changed to something like this. So we have some E21 and some E12. Uh, the non-symmetric. And that means that what we actually have is we have a shear plus a rotation component. So we have some element at this. Symmetric, and then some component that is asymmetric. That's just the rotation of the coordinates. And rotations don't change the energy. I mean, it's just like taking you know something to your desk and you rotate it around, unless there's you know some external magnetic field or whatever that's affecting it. Uh, it doesn't change anything. So we want to subtract rotations and 
only keep only keep the pure shear component. And we're going to do that by symmetrizing the strain tensor and replacing that strain tensor with a new one. I'm going to use epsilon for that. Epsilon is going to be E11, one half E12 plus E21, one half E13 plus E31, one half E12 plus E21, E22, one half. E two three plus E three two and one half E three one plus E one three one half E two three plus E three two and E three three. So we now have a symmetric tensor. And we've also thrown away this rotational component. And this is going to be the, the strains we're using. Uh, this is a tensor also. Also off, that's just what came out of my mouth and that's on the board. It's a tensor also. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that this strain tensor defines the shear strains differently than we had originally done over here in this corner of the board. And that's because we previously had this. And now what we have This. So we have the same symmetric uh, shearing going on. So whereas this we were defining as our gamma, this we're going to be defining as our epsilon and gamma ij. is equal to 2 epsilon ij. Just because this one had zero strain there. That will be okay? Okay. So we've got a tensor now. And our first tensor is the strain tensor. So let's move to stress. By the way, uh, I should point out that E11, gamma 1, 2, gamma 1, 3, gamma 2, 1, E2, 2, two gamma 2, 3, gamma 3, 1, gamma to epsilon three three is not a tensor, and the reason it's not a tensor is because one of the properties of a tensor is that you can apply uh, transformations to it and rotate it in the coordinate system, and because the way we define these gammas, uh, they're asymmetric. Uh, we can't apply rotations <coughs> and, and uh, rotate the tensor. So you'll see this sometimes. You can use it, but just be wary of it, knowing that if you want to then take and translate your transform your coordinate system, you have to transform into a uh, symmetrized uh, strain tensor. So let's move on to stress. 
And we talked about stresses last time. Again, that was kind of going over the uh, undergrad picture of things. The forest on an area, and it still is a forest on an area, but we're going to be applying a forest on a uh, infinitesimal cuboid. And in doing that, we'll have some Cuboid, we'll have this be our x1 direction, right hand rule, x2, x3. And then we'll define our normal uh, stresses to be sigma 1, 1. sigma 2, 2, and sigma 3, 3. So it's the force in the one direction on the one face, force on the, in the two direction on the two face, force on the three direction on the three face, and then we'll get the shears as well. So I'm going to show you my units right here. That's going to be sigma 1, 3, and sigma 1, 2. So force, oh, actually, I got it backwards. So this is a force on the i, I face. So i, j. This is going to be sigma 3, 1, sigma 3, 2, sigma 2, 3, sigma 2, 1. So that gives us our, our uh, stresses. Our stresses form a tensor as well. Stress and the strain tensor are second ranked tensors. And by second rank, I mean that they have two uh, subscripts. Okay. I'm filling it. Excellent. Next. Linear elasticity. Uh, what we're going to talk about does not work in nonlinear elasticity. So basically, we're talking about relatively small strains on materials that uh, have a, uh, well, the bonds are basically going to be a harmonic energy well. <coughs> uh, metals and ceramics. Uh, going to uh, elastic, highly elastic materials, uh, it's not going to work so well. Or going to materials where you start uh, having nonlinear behavior again, not, this is not going to work. Uh, and the reason that we want to work with linear elasticity is because it allows us to use Hooke's law and relate the stress to 
do the strain. Through a fourth rank tensor. So it's a tensor in four dimensional space that we call the stiffness constants or the elastic constants. Elastic constants. Uh, you can write that backwards. E epsilon ij is equal to s ij kl sigma kl. And now that is called the compliance tensor. Right, let's we'll double check on that. these lectures, I'm going to work everything in terms of the elastic constants, because that's kind of the, the way that is uh, easiest to think, at least from my perspective. Uh, many of the equations you'll use uh, out in application require working with the compliance tensor, and there's a ways to translate back and forth between the stiffness tensor and the compliance tensor, uh, and those equations are going to depend on the symmetry of the crystal you're working with. But for now, uh, we're just going to work with this fourth ring. It's that elastic constants. Uh, not worthy. We've got a K and an L here and here, which means this is a double sum. Sum over a sum over L, which means we have nine terms in the equation, which is why we're writing everything out in Einstein notation. Um, strictly speaking, there are going to be 81 total elastic constants. The good news is, mostly we don't need those. And the reason we don't need them is because both the strain tensor and the stress tensor are symmetric. So your E11, E12, E13, E epsilon uh, one two equal epsilon two one equals epsilon one two epsilon two two epsilon uh, two three epsilon three one equals epsilon one three epsilon three two equals epsilon two three epsilon three three. So the symmetry here and the symmetry in the stress tensors means that C I J K L equals C J I K L. So I can swap the order of the first two constants, or the first two subscripts, and C I J K L equals C I J L K. And I swap the second two uh, subscripts. So here we go from 81 C I J K L down to 36 C I J K L. So that's a big reduction. We want to keep uh, reducing that though. And to do that, we're going to look at the work to uh, deform a material. So let's do that here. Okay, 
So the thermodynamic the def definition of work is dW is equal to stress I, J, D, epsilon, I, J. So you take it, integrate this. Uh, those of you that have taken thermodynamics with me, 514, I talked a lot about the fact that uh, all energy is either heat or work, and all work is expressed as uh, a force in a conjugate uh, dimension. In the case of you know pushing a block on, on, a, on a plane, you've got a force and you've got a, a displacement. Uh, electric fields, elastic fields, uh, magnetic fields, stress and strain, these are all uh, forces and conjugate distances. So just in physics where you figure out the energy by integrating the force over the distance, here we're going to integrate the stress over the strain. Again, it's a double sum there, so you've got uh, an ij and ij, so you actually have all of the, ten all of the uh, uh, terms in that, uh, I guess nine terms. So let's take and uh, let's say we start at uh, purple here path one and path one we're going to start at uh, sigma equals epsilon equals zero an unstrained unstressed state and let's apply. Apply epsilon one one. So we apply a strain in the one direction, uh, a certain distance, and that gives us d work one is equal to stress a sigma one one d epsilon one one is equal to c one 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 epsilon 1, 1, e epsilon 1, 1. Right, then we'll substitute in our Hooke's law for the stress. And now we integrate both sides. And we integrate from 0 to epsilon 1, 1. So d epsilon 1, 1, they're dummy variables in, in the integ integral. And we're integrating to the value of epsilon one one, and that's going to give us uh, work into step one is equal to one half c one 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 epsilon one one squared. And next. We're going to take it in this strained state and apply uh, epsilon 2, 2. And if we do that, the second term in the work is equal to the integral from 0 to epsilon 2, 2, sigma 2, 2, d epsilon 2, 2 is equal to the integral from 0 to epsilon 2, 2. C two 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 epsilon two two plus C two two one one epsilon one one the epsilon one uh, two two W two is equal to one half C Two 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 epsilon two two squared plus c two two one one epsilon one one epsilon two two. So in the second integral, notice we had two terms. That's because uh, epsilon one one is not zero anymore, whereas before we started out in a stress-free, strain-free state, uh, but now 
in the second step, we, ha we don't have that. So now we have the total work of W1 plus W2 is equal to 1 half C1, 1, 1, 1, 1 epsilon 1, 1 squared plus 1 half C2, 2, 2, 2, 2 epsilon 2, 2 squared plus C2, 2, 2, 1, 1 epsilon 1, 1, 1 epsilon 2, 2. So the total work is going to have a uniaxial term, a uniaxial term, and then this cross interaction term. Okay? Now, that's the total energy, and we know that the total energy is a state function, which means it doesn't matter how we got there. It only matters where we are, right? So that's a consequence of, of uh, thermodynamics, which means that I could just as well first apply epsilon 2, 2, and then apply epsilon 1, 1. And if I'd done that, half 2, I'd wind up with work 1 is equal to, uh, work 1 is equal to 1 half C2222 two, 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 epsilon 2 2 squared, work 2 is equal to 1 half C2 two, two, C1111 one, 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 epsilon 1 1 squared plus C1122 one, one, two, two, epsilon 2 2 epsilon 1 1. So W tote is equal to one half C one 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 epsilon one one squared plus one half C two 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 epsilon two two squared plus C one one two two epsilon two two epsilon one one. And the only way that this term and this term can be equal is if, and where did my green marker go? Is if C I J K L is equal to C K L I J. So now I swap the first two terms with each other. So these simplifications, we go from 36 to 21. Classic constants. It's a big improvement over 81, but it's still a lot. Uh, and in general, if you're dealing with a crystal with zero symmetry, you're going to have to deal with a ton of elastic constants. But the good news is that as you go to higher and higher symmetry, uh, the number of unique elastic constants diminishes. So for example, if you have your little cuboid, you have your little cuboid, and uh, let's say you have a crystal that can rotate fourfold around the z-axis. Well, that means that pulling it in the 1, 1 and the 2, 2 directions have to be the same, right? You have a cube, a cubic crystal. It doesn't know whether you do this or you do this. So that means that having a fourfold rotation axis around the z-axis uh, makes uh, C2211 equal to C1111. 
to 2. Oh, sorry. Make C 1, 1, 1, 1, and C 2, 2, 2, 2 equivalent. And for every symmetry class, you're going to have a different number of elastic constants. There's a book by me. Uh, he's got a whole chapter just of tables of how tensors and tensors change their symmetry with uh, applying different uh, uh, symmetry groups. Uh, in the case of a cubic crystal, which we're going to work with from now on, uh, only three elastic constants. And those elastic constants are C1111, C1122, and C2323. So you need three elastic constants to be able to work with a cubic crystal. All is okay. I feel kind of like a little robot with all the numbers, but yeah. That's uh, <laughs> elasticity theory. It, it's, it's a great thing. Elasticity theory makes your life a lot simpler uh, if you can actually you know, apply it to simplify the physical properties you're working with. But uh, so, okay. We can make the numbers better, though. And we will make the numbers better by using what's called void notation. So let's introduce that now. you to get rid of the four i, j, k, l. So for uh, your i, j, or k, l values of 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, slash 3, 2, 3, 1, slash 1, 3, 1, 2, slash 2, 1. You're going to replace those with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So now your C1111 one, 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 one is C11. One, one. Your C1122 one, one, two, two is C12. And your C2323 is two, three, two, three, is C44. Four, four. It simplifies the notation considerably. Um, so now, our work term, E W is equal to sigma 1 D epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 D epsilon 2. Well, let's write this in. Let's, uh, I'll do it anyway, why not? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, is that last one for C3, uh, is it C2223? Two, two, oh. two, yeah, 2323. Three. Three. should be C, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so that means, the infinitesimal work can be written as sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 6 d epsilon 6 plus sigma 5 d epsilon 5 
plus sigma. Why am I writing this way? Oh, that is. Sigma 6 d epsilon 6 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2 plus sigma 4 d epsilon 4 plus sigma 5 d epsilon 5 plus sigma 4 d epsilon 4 plus sigma 3 d epsilon 3. So there's still nine terms, but I wrote this in a way that I hope you can see there's symmetries here. Right. So these two are symmetric, these two, and these two. So you can re reduce the total down to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six terms instead of having to write out all nine. I'm not going to write that out, but you can see you just have two multiplied by sigma five. Uh, writing this, using this void notation, it also means we don't have to write in four dimensional space anymore, right? Because in The strictest terms, this sigma sigma to C epsilon, that is a second rank tensor, second rank tensor, and a fourth rank tensor. But now, if you want to, you can write it out this way. Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4. Sigma 5, sigma 6, sigma 4, sigma 5, sigma 6 is equal to epsilon 1, epsilon 2, dot, 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 epsilon 5, epsilon 6. And now this would be C11, C12, dot, 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 dot. C14, C15, C16, C14, C15, C16, C12, C13, da, 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 da. Well, I'll wrap this full row, full column. C12, C13, C14, C15, C16, C14, C15. C16. Yeah. It makes it possible to write it out. Uh, and we can even take this and simplify it further, writing it in compact form. And in compact form, we do this. Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4, sigma 5, sigma 6. C11, C12, C16, C12. C16, C66. So instead of having it be 9 by 9, so this is a uh, 9 by 1, 9 by 1, I'm sorry, 9 by 9, 9 by 1. Now we have 6 by 1, 6 by 6, and then we have to rewrite the strain as epsilon 1 epsilon 2, epsilon 3, gamma 4, gamma 5, gamma 6. 
So you go back in, you substitute in the gamma values for your shear strains. Uh, and that lets you write it out as a, as a compact rotation. Uh, this on a tensor. So don't try to apply tensor uh, transformations to it. You have to go back to the, the full uh, 81 uh, cell for that. Um, again, it looks terrible. But symmetry is our friend. This is what you get for a uh, no zero symmetry crystal for a cubic. You get this. C I J cubic C one one C one two C one two C one two C one one C one two C one two C one two C one one C four four C four four C four four Zero, zero, zero. This is the uh, uh, the elastic constants for a, a cubic material. You get a bunch of zeros, and in fact, you're going to get a bunch of zeros in all of these, but they're going to be symmetry dependent. So. So I'll have one more a statement about where we are and where we're going, and then we'll uh, take a break until next time, and next time we'll come in and we'll uh, turn this into isotropy elasticity theory, in which we go from having three elastic constants to only two. Um, so the last comment is about uh, figuring out what these are, uh, figuring out what the elastic constants are, and then that, to a large extent, comes about because we can measure the energy to uh, apply loads. So the total energy is equal to one half sum pi equals one to six sum J equals 1 to 6, C, I, J, epsilon, I, epsilon, J. And in the case of a cubic material, U is equal to 1 half C, 1, 1, epsilon 1 squared plus epsilon 2 squared plus epsilon 3 squared plus 2C44, four four, epsilon 4 squared plus epsilon 5 squared plus epsilon 6 squared, plus C12, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, plus epsilon 2, epsilon 3, plus epsilon 3, epsilon 1. So the, the name of the game is to uh, apply strains and have a measurement of the energy going into it. Uh, for a person such as myself who's interested in modeling, uh, we're interested in having someone measure the elastic constants, or more importantly, measure, for example, the speed of sound in a material and back out the elastic constants, and then uh, for our empirical models, some you know, fictitious you know, spring between atoms that, that allow things to vibrate, uh, we want to figure out what the right elastic constant or what the right uh, fitting constants are for our model to uh, yield the energies that match real life. How to go from the cubic <clears throat> elastic uh, structures 
to the anisotropic uh, expression. And there's this thing called the uh, let's see. There's this expression called the uh, uh, anisotropy ratio. further from one, then you have a, a larger effect from anisotropy, <clears throat> meaning the different directions in the crystals in the crystal has more uh, impact. So let, let's see where this comes from. I think what I'll do is I'll write this over here. Some of, the, some of the math I do in this first bit, we'll, we'll come back to and you'll see uh, where that comes from uh, in the second half of the lecture. So let, let's begin by saying that uh, we have strain. That is only <clears throat> uh, in a, a unilateral strain in the uh, one direction. And if that's the only strain we feel, then we can write that the stress is equal to C11, one, 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 one. and strain 2, 2 equals strain 3, 3 equals C12, one, two, C11, one, one. is equal to C12 over C11. One, one. <clears throat> so that's just from our uh, relationship here. Now, if we take and we rotate the crystal uh, 45 degrees around the z-axis, a transformation tensor, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, that later, but right now, what you should know is that the <coughs> transformation tensor will be this. <coughs> and this is going to take our <clears throat> x1 translated into an x1 prime, x2 into an x2 prime, and x3 into an x3 prime. So I'm using primes to indicate the, that's our new coordinate system. <clears throat> and the way that uh, strain and stress tensors, so these are to tensor, the way that those transform uh, according to I j prime is equal to T I L T J N epsilon L N <coughs> Just know that these are, uh, room. these are uh, uh, dummy suffix notation. So uh, you wind up here with a uh, uh, rank 
trying to, uh, sorry, a, a double sum over uh, the index L and the index N. <clears throat> but because everything's zero except for epsilon one one, we get epsilon one two prime to T one one T two one 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 equal to negative one half epsilon one one. So zero is your friend. Uh, and that's why you see uh, engineers oftentimes saying, well, let's approximate this as plane strain or plane stress, because that lets them throw a bunch of zeros into the, the tensors and, and makes you know, the cost of ink a lot uh, less for them. And in a similar fashion, I, J prime C two T I L T J N sigma L N. So sigma one two prime is equal to <clears throat> Two or negative one half C one one epsilon one one plus one half sigma one two epsilon one one. <clears throat> so you can see kind of where this is going. Tells us then that sigma one two prime is equal to c one one minus c one two epsilon prime one two and epsilon one two prime is equal to two c. <clears throat> Which means that two C four four equals C one one minus C one two if the uh, stress strain relationship uh, both in the original direction and in the rotated direction are the same. And that then leads to our uh, anisotropy ratio. So What this means is it means that we can simplify our elasticity expressions because we no longer need all three. We'll only we'll be able to get by with simply two. Well, let's uh, keep that here. Let's keep that uh, two C or four equals C11 minus C12. So we have sigma 11 one one is equal to C11 one one epsilon 11 one one plus C12 epsilon 12 plus C12 epsilon. Three from in from here, but then applying that well, is equal to lambda plus two omega Where where C one 
2 and mu is equal to c4, 4, four is equal to 1 half c11 one one minus c12. So this uh, is telling us about the 1, 1, 2, 2 elastic constant. That's our shear modulus. So that's uh, C1212, which are the uh, elastic constants in front of the uh, shear stress and strain. And then this term, uh, we're calling the Lame constant. And we can now write out all of our uh, stress tensor in terms of the shear modulus and Lame constants. So let me do that shorthand. No, that one doing. How do I do this? I'll do the stress strain. A short way to write this. diagonal terms and our off diagonal terms to 3 is equal to <clears throat> 2 C 4 4 uh, well, I don't write that way. Oh, I don't that. 2 C 4 4 epsilon 2 3 is equal to 2 U Epsilon two, three, and one, two, and our off diagonal terms. So this means that our elastic constants can be rewritten J K L is equal to mu del I K del J L plus del I L del J K plus Lame constant, del i j, del a l, where this del j is equal to one that's the Kronecker delta. and we can move these around some. So we've got these two expressions, and we also have uh, 
lambda plus 2 mu equals c11. One, one. the elastic work in terms of these new constants. So our elastic work is lambda plus 2 mu plus epsilon 3, 3 squared plus 3 mu epsilon 2, 3 squared epsilon 3, 1 squared epsilon 1, 2 squared minus epsilon 1, 1 epsilon 2, 2 minus epsilon 1, 1 epsilon 2, 2 minus epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3. So that gives us our work now. If you know the strain, then you can get the work. And we can introduce new constants as well. 1 half lambda plus 2 mu that's supposed to be epsilon 1, 1 times epsilon 3, 3, and then minus epsilon 2, 2? 1, 1, 2, 2, ah, uh, yeah. Right. 3, 3, yeah. Uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3. Yeah. So then the, the Lemay constant plus 2, the shear modulus, 1 half is equal to 1 over E modulus or uh, elastic modulus and two mu <coughs> one plus mu over E. Mu is the Poisson ratio. K is equal to negative epsilon one one plus epsilon two two plus epsilon three three over one third. Sigma one one plus sigma two two plus sigma three three. So that is equal to negative e over p. So this k is the compressibility ratio. P is pressure. <coughs> pressure is, you know, a uh, uniform uh, force uh, in all three directions, and this is the strain that is felt under pressure. So you have the compressibility ratio. And from and this question on work, you have an open parentheses after the three mu. Does that close at the end of the times three three? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the three mu goes uh, across that expression. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then from the compressibility ratio, you can get well right over here. equal to 1 over B, both modulus, which 
which is equal to 3 over 3 lambda plus 2 mu. Guys, and other expressions we can have. So, just taking and substituting these, we can get E is equal to mu three lambda plus two mu over mu plus lambda is equal to 9 mu b over 3 b plus mu over 2 mu plus mu. So there's a bunch of things that we can do just with playing with algebra. And then at the end of the day, we can go back and I'm going to wipe these out. And we can rewrite the strains in terms of the stresses. basically the, the setup of anisotropic elasticity theory. We have, uh, you know, a lot of just algebra that I showed you here, uh, but uh, fundamentally, the real crux of it is, is that you've got the uh, anisotropy ratio, which tells you uh, how the elastic constants get reduced and then you can rewrite using the Lemay constant and the shear modulus, and then from that it simplifies everything into stresses and strains in terms of those, or in terms of two of those constants and the stresses, or two of the constants and uh, the shear strains, or sorry, the strains. Is this okay so far? It's handy to, to see it at some point. Uh, and it's good to know that it comes from a more or less reasonable place. So 
what I want to do now is I want to go back and I want to review just basic tensors. And uh, we've been using them, but I, I thought that we'd review where they come from and, and how they operate. And then in the next lecture, we'll look at the consequences of tensors being tensors. And in particular, we're going to look at uh, Moore's circle and the idea of having principal axes and principal uh, stresses and strains. And then follow that up uh, with going back to inhomogeneous stress-strain relationships, which is what you need any time that you have something dynamical happening. For example, you've got a, a, a wave passing through, a sound wave passing through a material. Uh, that's going to depend on having uh, different uh, densities in the material due to the, the motion of atoms. So tensors. Tensors I think of them as basically uh, constants of proportionality. And I know that's not mathematically the way people do, but in terms of application, uh, they really are used as constants of proportionality. So for example, uh, we've got uh, the uh, charge density. You can write the charge density being proportional to an applied electric field. And both of these are, are vectors. And what relates them is a constant of proportionality, the electrical conductivity. And if you want to, you can think of vectors as a first rank tensor. And then what relates to first rank tensors is a second rank tensor. As it's a tensor, uh, well, I'll write this out. So we've got our vectors, and then we have our tensor. Expressed uh, this by this relationship can be expressed as <clears throat> in dummy suffix notation. J. So again, we're using Einstein notation. So having two j's on the same side of the equation means that we have a, a sum over j's. And this seems to be toast. Uh, so what is nice about tensors is that, or what makes a tensor a tensor, is the fact that uh, it allows us to transform space, and in particular rotate space, so we can take our x1, x2, x3 space, and transform that to x1 prime, 
x2 prime, x3 prime, and in doing that, we can write a transformation tensor that will allow us to transform the rank 1 and the higher rank tensors as well. So, say sigma, okay. I'm using alphas in my notes, alpha 1, 1 is equal to the angle between x1 and x1 prime, alpha 1, 2 is equal to the angle One and x two prime dot 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 i j is equal to the angle between x i x j prime. So from the angles, we could then make a table. Cosines, cosine one two, cosine alpha one three, cosine alpha two one, cosine alpha two two, cosine alpha two three, cosine alpha three one. Two sine alpha three three. And this is going to be our T that I call our transformation tensor. Is that alpha IJ? Uh, this is alpha ij, yeah, is the angle between the uh, xi and xj prime axes. So now we've got, we can make a table of our x prime and our x, and then each element is going to be cosine of the alpha between the coordinates. And that makes our transformation tensor. And with the transformation tensor, <clears throat> if we have, well, I used a V in my notes, but I think it might make more sense to just pick one of our vectors up here. You see that J I prime is equal to T I J. So basically, we're taking our uh, three J uh, components and we're projecting them onto the new direction. So we've got the cosine of the angle between them. So that's why this expression works. So when do we use the transformation tensors that tensors? Any time that you want to rotate your coordinate systems. Like in space? 
in space, or for example, if you are, uh, well, let's say you have, you have a part and you're pulling on it, so you know the load in the you know, z direction, but you're interested in how that translates into a load, say, 45 degrees from that. You would, you would uh, have rotated, so even though, so you know all the stress-strain relationships this way, but you want to talk about it in a different coordinate system. And that, that's kind of what's most nice about this, because when we get to stress-strain, which is next, uh, the stress at a point we can express as a uh, second rank tensor, and then we can rotate that to change our reference frame. So this, this is the reason, the reason that this transformation works is because we're taking the projection of our old vector onto the next new direction. And if we want to, we can reverse that and we recognize that, for example, that, uh, sorry, I should point out here that here, I, didn't, I skipped a line of my notes and I, I shouldn't have. Uh, this is for, uh, I'll just erase it here. This is for T1, J, 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 one prime. So J1 prime at one goes into the first uh, suffix here. You still have a sum over J's. It gives you this. So these are projections of the J onto the J prime coordinate system. And then going backwards, <coughs> the reverse of that is that J1 is equal to T11, V1 prime, T1, J1 prime plus T21, J2 prime plus T31, J3 prime, or Ji is equal to T. J I J J. So so in these two expressions. Uh, writing out uh, J prime in terms of J and J in terms of J prime, the suffixes just change order. Okay, so is that okay? Yeah, okay. So let's look at the implications of this on our second rank tensor. And basically, I will erase this. So in the case of our second rank tensor, got these, and we also have T i prime is equal to T i j, E j, and E i is equal to T j i E j prime. So that means that we can write J I prime is equal to T I J 
J, J, and that term can be rewritten T I J sigma J K E K from here, and then E K can be rewritten. T I J Sigma J K T L K E L prime. And this term is simply Sigma I L prime. So, J I prime is equal to sigma I prime L prime E L prime, which means that this is the transformation from of the second rank tensor in the first coordinate space into the, the second. for a little bit. Sigma I L prime is equal to T I. So this notice is a double sum because we've got J, J, K, K. So there's 81 terms in the transformation. But the also the important thing is, is that uh, these are just each one of those are just values, so we don't have to write it this way, and in fact, this is kind of the least simple way to remember it. So most of the time, people will write something that looks like this. Easier way to remember the ordering is that you know, the left side has got the I and L, and the right side has got the J and K. But if you remember the other way, that's fine too. Well, I'll just down here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about. Uh, this T, uh, this transformation tensor. Uh, T has uh, special properties. Uh, it has the properties that it well that make it uh, a uh, unitary orthogonal. Uh, and what this means is it means that it rotates the tensor and it maintains the amplitude of the vectors and tensors that it rotates. Uh, so there is no change in, in the, the magnitude, it just rotates them from one direction into another. Uh, it also has the properties that because <clears throat> erase this that because B prime is equal to T V and so I prime is equal to I J and T 
inverse b prime is equal to t inverse t b is equal to v. So a matrix that is as inverse or equal to one. And we know that v is equal to t inverse v prime v i prime that t inverse is simply equal to t transpose. That's something that's, that's interesting about it. Uh, also, I'm not going to prove this, but I'm going to write it out anyhow. delta. Um, and then this is important because this is what gives us the uh, unitary orthogonal behavior, right? It, when you start adding up or, or start writing out your trans transformations, uh, you need to have uh, this, otherwise you wind up with uh, uh, increases in the, the magnitude, right? You, here's going to be one more. Zero is only two outputs. Uh, so now that we have T, we can do things with it. And I want to write out a couple of relations that you may find useful in your future. For example, derivatives. If you're taking the derivative with respect to x i prime coordinate, then we can rewrite that as dxj dx i prime d d x j. So we multiply and divide by dxj, and then we have that d by dx. I prime of x j is equal to d of d x i prime of t i j x j prime, which by chain rule gives us zero plus t i j, which means that the differential in the new coordinate system is equal to T i j d d x j. So you can use the transformation uh, tensor to transform your coordinate systems as well. And the reverse of that is you can go backwards, t x i is equal to t j i d x j prime. And that's, again, just because t and t inverse are transposed to one another. OK, and lastly, I want to, uh, not lastly, I guess, but uh, I want to take a step back toward stress strain. By the way, is this okay? It's just kind of basic math stuff. Uh, nothing controversial, I don't think. Um, so I want to take a step back and I want to talk about stress strain because stress strain, unlike uh, current and uh, electric field, uh, they are themselves second rank tensors meaning that they're related by a fourth rank tensor. So 
we can write out our stress and our strain transformations switching the order of the uh, suffix in the uh, transformation tensors. allows us to write sigma i j prime is equal to t i l t j n sigma l n we're writing sigma t i l t j n c L N A B Epsilon A B be writing Epsilon T I L T J N C L M A B T F A T H B Epsilon prime F H. So this is C I J F H prime. Um, so I guess we could rewrite that if we wanted to. C I J F H is equal to T I L T J N T F A T H B C I J F H. That's right. S prime. L-M-A-B. So again, we lumped together coefficients to make it easier to remember the transformation. And, and again, these. So what? Is that an M or N? Uh, that is an N. Actually, in my notes, it's an M. But when I wrote it up here, I wrote it as an N. So it became an N, and I tried to translate it in my brain as I was reading and writing. Uh, and hence there's, a film. There's an H as well? There's an H. Uh, there's an H. Yeah. Uh, H, T, H. So this must be... Here's the H. Yeah. So I, J, F, H. That's a B, that's a B. Yeah. That one, the second T from the end, the subscript is what A? Oh, uh, F. I made that an F-A, because when I was writing these notes last night, I lost inspiration, <laughs> and I felt like I was using the same letters over and over again. Uh, and then it's also worth noting that this whole uh, unitary orthogonality means that T-I-L-T-J-N-T-G? I'm not sure. 
L G H M D D G I L T G L T J M T H. Are you adding N's and M's? Yes, I am. Let me let me do this in a. Well, I can only have to write it once. There's a coordinate transformation here that I'm missing. So let me let me write this. I J. Let's just I J K L M N O P. We'll do that. T I T J T K T L M O N P. So swapping those Delta. IK Delta JL JL. So it's it still behaves as a unitary transformation matrix. One last quick question on the sigma IJ or uh, epsilon IJ at the bottom, the epsilon prime. That last one? Uh, that should be a, a L and. Shouldn't it be L? Okay. Shouldn't it be L and. Uh, oh, Shouldn't it be oh, NL? Because oh. if you look at the sigma. So I did sigma I, IJ. Yeah, this should be IJ. Those should be IJ. This should be. Well, actually, the way it is in hand, let me write the one Shouldn't it just be an So the way L? I wrote this was I kept this, I'm going to keep this as an L and N, and then I want to, that should be an L, I, that should be L, I, N, J. Yeah, N, J. And L, N, at the end? I was just asking if it shouldn't be NL rather than LN. Uh, here? Yeah. It's LN all the way up. This should be LN, yeah, because I okay. kept LN all the way up. What I did is I, I, uh, oh, as I, I went from here to here, I switched yeah, you switch those, those, and then two. here I kept IJ, IJ, LN, LN, okay. and then I switched the suffix in the uh, uh, T's. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Okay, and okay. So leading in to the next lecture, let's talk about uh, the properties of, of tensors. And here's kind of where some of my notation went sideways. So let me, uh, you know what? I'll transform these into sigmas because Epsilons because they're true. Uh, so let's say we got a, a, a second rank tensor. Let's call it epsilon. And this epsilon tensor is defined as symmetric if epsilon i j is equal to epsilon j i. And it is anti-symmetric or skew-symmetric if 
epsilon i j is equal to negative epsilon j i. Now, our strain tensor and stress tensor are both symmetric, and they're symmetric by design. Uh, and that's because we can take any tensor and transform it into a sum of a symmetric and an anti-symmetric tensor. So for example, if I had some E, well, let me write it this way. Then we want to replace those, all right, just for the sake of uh, E, or E's E's for those instead. And the reason I want to use E's is because we can write any E, I, to J, one half, E, I, J, plus E, J, I, plus one half, E, I, J, minus E, J, I. So this is a symmetric part. This is anti-symmetric. And you remember, this is what we did in the last lecture, where we went from our E's to epsilon, our strain tensor. But the other thing that's important that I want to kind of end on here is that any symmetric tensor can be rotated to form a tensor that looks like this. You are in the Zoom meeting now. This meeting is being recorded. So we've got our, uh, this. Uh, are they in our class, or? I don't think so. No. I think it's the one after us. All right, so we have uh, this. This is called a uh, main diagonal or a principal diagonal matrix. The main diagonal elements, these are called principal components. And principal axes. If you have some arbitrary shaped body with surface forces, those surface forces lead to internal forces in the material. If at any point we have some arbitrary we cut across this material, we can then characterize the force that's resultant on that surface. And I'm calling that P. Well, this force, I can then project into the normal direction and into the tangential direction, which will allow us to define a uh, normal stress in which we have the force uh, times the area times the cosine of the angle and the shear stress which is the force divided by the area times sine of the angle. The shear can then be broken into an x and y component if we define an x and a y component there in which we then project the shear with the sine phi and the cosine phi. The strain is defined as the infinitesimal uh, strain in terms of the uh, infinitesimal change in the length over the uh, divided by the total length and integrating that from the initial length to the final length, we get the strain. Zero. 
to what start. What is the angle? Big one. Uh, is it in fact, is it the angle T is it between y oh, and z axis? Uh, v, 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 is, v, is, v, is, uh, v is between the projected, uh, the projection of the force onto the area and the uh, y axis. Oh. So if I, if I draw it this way. That is theta, and then that's t. And uh, from this, what we want to do is we, we want to be able to talk about uh, the forces being applied to these, and in particular, how taking and, and changing these angles are going to wind up changing the stresses. Now, uh, these stresses uh, are written like, uh, I guess it's kind of a simplified form, and at the end of the day, we want to get our stresses <clears throat> into the tensor notation. do is we're going to simplify, we're going to simplify what we're looking at and we'll, we'll start from a plain stress condition uh, because that will give us a, a bunch of zeros and let us think about two-dimensional problems and then go from two-dimensional problems to uh, three dimensions. <clears throat> so if we take the plain stress condition stress condition uh, gives us that sigma 3, or sigma 3, 3, uh, is equal to 0, and tau, um, sorry, I want to get the notation right, uh, is equal to 0. basically talking about a two-dimensional sheet in which we could have, instead of a cuboid, stress state and is in an x1, x2, x3 coordinate system. Or let's call it x1 and x2. So you think of it as this, this is, is how we, we uh, uh, sliced our uh, surface. But let's define a new surface centered around the point we're interested in. And we're going to define the new surface as having a normal the x1 prime direction. So we're going to be doing a coordinate transformation from the x1, x2 to the x1 prime, x2 prime. Find that as our theta. This in a different color. Why don't I? This x1 prime and x2 prime. And this is our area. A. 
<clears throat> so we've got these. One, two, three. And actually, we only have three stresses because sigma one two equals sigma two one due to symmetry uh, as our non-zero components, and we want to take and write the forces due to these stresses. So we've got a force in the one direction and in the two direction. So the force in the one direction is due to the stress in the one well, reason. Stress is equal to force over area. So the force in the one direction is the stress in the one direction multiplied by the area. Force in the two direction is the stress multiplied by the area, which can be written as sigma 1, 1, A cosine theta plus. I'm fighting with the notation of my prior self. Uh, 2, 1, A theta to sigma 2, 2, a sine theta plus sigma 1, 2, a cosine theta. So we took the uh, normal component, and that is the normal component of the, uh, the normal component of the area in the one direction. So that can be a sine theta, and this distance would be a sine theta. So that's where we got these components from. And then we have this stresses that are uh, normal or tangential. Okay. And then the stresses this uh, up here, I guess. Stresses just have to do with the fact we, we know uh, these components from our, our tensor. Zero. We know these components from our tensor, uh, so we can write the stresses out by projecting them uh, or collecting them from the uh, tensor. Means that then. Is it sigma 2 2 times sine theta? Ah, it must. Let's see. So that's going to be 2 2. notes. So let's see. Yeah, that's a sign theta. Okay, 
Yes, that's fine, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Which means that then, I'll change colors again. We can write, let's try, let's say, equal one, one prime is equal to x one cosine theta plus x two sine theta and sigma one and two prime is equal to Theta. And then we can substitute in these to get right here. Sigma one one cosine theta plus Sigma one two sine theta cosine theta plus sigma two two sine theta plus sigma one two cosine theta sine theta. And the second one is sigma two two sine theta plus the one, two, cosine theta, cosine theta, minus sigma one, one, cosine theta, plus sigma one, two, sine theta, sine theta, <coughs> and then simplify those right over here, simplify those to Sigma one two sine theta cosine theta and sigma one two prime is equal to sigma one two cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta plus sigma two two minus sigma one one. So we got those, and then to get the sigma 2, 2, we need to rotate the plane. And have the plane That's our normal. Following that through, skip some of the steps in the middle to make it a little bit faster.
Sign uh, we'll substitute that in. And we'll also substitute in Two plus S two sine theta plus pi over two. So that's our original, where we've got the uh, stress is equal to the uh, stress being projected. Putting these in and these in over here and get. So far, so good. Now, a little bit of trigonometric substitution, which, by the way, the CRC uh, mathematical table book is one of the greatest things ever written. Uh, you'd think that with software these days, you would just things into the computer, but having this book of tables actually means that you can do substitutions that uh, you don't necessarily remember yourself. For example, using uh, over here, cosine squared theta is equal to cosine 2 theta plus 1 over 2 sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cosine 2 theta over 2, 2 sine theta cosine theta theta and Those, these equations, <coughs> and become And 
now we can talk about the implications of this. So the implications of this, one, is that sigma 1 prime plus sigma 2 prime is equal to sigma 1 1 prime plus sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2. Uh, and what this means is it means that for all the angles, the uh, trace of the stress tensor is invariant. Whatever you do to rotating it, the main diagonals, uh, the sum of the main diagonals stay the same. Another implication is that the maximum uh, and the minimum, this is the, uh, for the normals, so he's a 1, 1, comma, 2, 2, 1, 1, comma, 2, 2. One two is equal to zero. So you, when you can uh, take your stress tensor and rotate it such that you have a main diagonal, and we know that from last time that's your principal components. Uh, that's when you have the maximum stresses. Sigma one two max. Five over four from zero. So going back to that, yeah. It's six for sigma two two prime. Is it sigma one plus sigma two or sigma one one plus sigma two two? Oh, sorry, one one. Yeah. As I'm, I'm, I'm fighting against my former self. The same and, question. Yeah. Yeah, and in my my when I wrote the notes, I was. When I wrote the notes. I wrote them in void notation based on notes that I had written with x, y's, and z's. Uh, and now I'm correcting them on the board as I go. So occasionally you'll see those. Let, let me know and I'll, I'll fill them in. Uh, so if you know when you've got your principal stress uh, arrangement, then if you rotate by uh, 45 degrees, that gives you the maximum shear stress. Or one one normal stress is the maximum two from so the normal maximum is rotated by a ninety degrees from the minimum. So, or zero, I should say, is the minimum uh, of the shear stress is pi over four from max min one one two two variety and six of the uh, one one two two stresses. And the one two uh, are a sine wave, and then seven, which I alluded to before, you get principal. A principal orientation that looks like that. That will give you the maximum and minimum stresses. So, when you 
write down sigma one one below, and when you write down sigma one 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 as superscript, does oh. it mean anything like contravariant covariant, or is it just a mistake? No, I, I just meant that. I meant that normal stresses versus uh, shear stresses. So if you want to put this down here, you can do that too. One one two two. One one comma two two. Yeah, just for the fine. third one, you write down different things, like sigma 1, 1, yeah, 0, and yeah, max yeah. up side. I, I can't put it down here, I'll be fine. 1, 1, 2, 2. 1, 1, 2, 2. 1, 2, 2. 2, 2. So, the question is, I want to step to the map here. Yeah, I got time. So, we'll step to the map here and show you uh, the punchline of it. But these are the, the physical implications. The mathematical implications are that we can take, let's, so let's take, uh, Let's take that. And you know what? Okay, well, I'll take that and then I'll rewrite it in this form. Sigma one one prime minus sigma one one. Two two over two square is equal to sigma one one minus sigma two two over two cosine two theta one d squared plus sigma one two sine two theta squared plus two sigma one one minus sigma two two over two cosine two theta Skip a step there. Uh, I moved this term over to the left hand side and then I multiplied both the left and the right hand side. I took this the square of both the left and the right hand side. So I got the square here, 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 and then you got the cross terms. So that, that, that's taking the, uh, uh, the square of the left and the right side with this first term moved over to the left side. And then doing the same thing to the shear component. Doing the same thing to the shear component, I can get uh, sigma 1, 2 prime squared is equal to sigma 2, 2 minus sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 2, 2 over 2 sine 2 theta squared plus sigma 2 cosine 2 theta squared plus 2 sigma 2, 2 minus sigma 1, 1 over 2 sine Theta sigma one two cosine two theta. 
and then I can take these two, add them together, because there's a difference in sign here to here. Those terms go away, and you're left with left with sigma 1, 1 prime minus sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 over 2 squared plus sigma 1, 2 prime is equal to sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 2, 2 over 2 squared cosine squared 2 theta plus sine squared 2 theta, which goes to 1, plus sigma 1, 2 squared cosine squared 2 theta plus sine squared 2 theta, which goes to 1. That then simplifies to, I write it over here, sigma 1 prime minus sigma 1 plus sigma 2 over 2 squared plus, sorry, sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2. Did I mess that up over there? No. No. Plus sigma 1, 2 squared is equal to sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 2, 2 over 2 squared plus sigma 1, 2. This is the equation of a circle. We've got x plus h squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Which one? The sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2, 4. Ah, did I? I miss it. Sorry, should be here. It's parenthesis in there. From in there. Yeah. So this then gives us a circle in which. our stress state here for this sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 sigma 1 2 this middle point that's h this distance means that if, for example, we rotate this up to here by theta,
now sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2 uh, have the same value. And our shear stress is at a maximum. When we rotate it, drawing, we rotate it so we're at this point, then we have the principal stresses, and we have zero, we have zero stress, we have zero shear stress, and, oh, sorry, I made a mistake here, that angle represents two theta, and it has to represent two theta because if we go from the maximum stress to the max, sorry, the maximum normal stress to the maximum shear stress, or from the zero shear stress to the maximum shear stress, we know that this has to be uh, 45 degrees to pi over 4. So we're calling the angular relation uh, 2 theta. So for this to be pi over 4, then the rotation on the page is going to be pi over 2. This is more circle. So I'm, uh, now, generalizing this from two dimensions, the plane stress condition to three involves a little more math, and I will show you the picture of what it involves and then skip to the answer. Uh, basically, it involves us writing out exactly the same math, but now we've defined a plane here, with some normal, and we do the exact same steps in uh, three dimensions. But the same result comes out. And then that same result is that more circle in 3D is a sphere. No, not a sphere, but it's three circles. We should call it more circles. Is this oh, more circles? Uh, and this is going to be your actually just call this a sigma i j and call this a sigma k k. So the normal stresses and the uh, shear stresses. So a stress state might look like something like this. Be a stress state in Mohr's circle. With these would be your three principal axes. One, two, three. And you'd have some orientation that would give you sigma P1, sigma P2, sigma P3, zero, 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 like that. And then as you rotate them, they, they move uh, relative to each other. So this would be sigma
So with these, we can talk about special cases now. Unless is more circle clear how it works? I, I assume that <coughs> people coming here from mechanical engineering and possibly materials have seen this before, but uh, others this is probably new for. Uh, so let's special cases in more circle. So let's take Sigma one one equals greater than zero, sigma two two equals sigma three three equals zero. So if you've got that, You've got uniaxial uh, tension. Which means you'll have something that looks like this. Have two circles on top of each other. Because you're going to have uh, these two have to be zero. And that also means that right here, you have one circle with zero radius. Right? And that's because you need to have these two on top of each other when you have uh, that stress state. And the implications are that then you're going to have zero shear stresses uh, inside of this circle, and the shear stresses in these two circles are going to be identical. And the same thing that be true for sigma 2, 2, less than zero. We can go to let's pick one color. Sigma one one greater than sigma one one greater than sigma two two greater than zero and sigma three three equal to zero. That's by actual strain. stress, and that will give you, it looks like this, so that one is going to be at zero, and then your other two on that side, we can have something similar to this special case. We can have sigma 1, 1 greater than sigma 2, 2 equal to sigma 3, 3. In that case, we would have, again, two circles on top of each other. But now those two circles would be shifted. Sigma 1, 1 equals sigma 2, 2 equals sigma 3, 
three. This is hydrostatic loading and hydrostatic loading. And this case is the case that gives you a set of circles that are perfectly centered around the origin. Because the bat, which tells us then that the sigma of 1, 2 equals sigma. That's how you wind up with circles that have the uh, stress state and the uh, normal loading the same. And it's kind of a last statement which is useful to know sometimes. Uh, there are three invariant relationships that come out uh, from Moore circle. And I'm not going to show where they come from, but they're worth knowing because you use them uh, oftentimes in, in uh, derivations. The first invariant is just the trace. The second invariant the cross terms between the uh, uh, normal stresses one one minus the shear Variant are the uh, cross interactions. Those come out of the uh, more circle derivation. Any questions about this? Yeah. yeah. I actually have no idea about more circle. Can you talk about it more? Like why you're representing the tensions in such like a circles? Well, the okay. So the representation itself is just a consequence of a bunch of math. So we, we step through the math and. As a result of the math, ta-da, here we are. Uh, the important thing is that it helps you think about, uh, it helps you think in a visual way about the stress state. Uh, for example, um, for example, we know that, you know, I, I showed the special case of the, of the hydrostatic, right? Well, the hydrostatic stress, I knew that the, the three principal axes were all at exactly the same point, and that told me that the shears had to be zero everywhere. And I could go through and I could prove that to myself mathematically, 
Or what I could do is I could just draw a circle and say all three are a point, therefore shear is zero. And it is a shortcut for, for thinking. It's, it's also a shortcut for thinking when you think about rotations. So for example, if you're uh, doing a uniaxial uh, tensile pull, or any part in loading, but let's say you're, you're pulling a metal part, right? Uh, the directions that you see plastic flow are actually all along these directions. And the reason the plastic flow and dislocations are flowing there is because you're loading it in uniaxial, uniaxial uh, tension. And in this case, say it was this. So that gonna be sigma one one, that's gonna be sigma two two, sigma three three, right? So if I know the size of sigma one one, presumably I'm, I know what I'm loading it in, then that tells me that at uh, 2 theta equals 90 degrees, theta equals 45 degrees, in this case, 45 degrees, I have sigma 1, 2 is equal to 1 half of sigma 1, 1. Again, you can figure it out by doing the math, or in these special cases, you say, well, you know, I, I know the stress state, I'll draw a circle, I'll figure out what the, what the loading is. Mm -hmm. uh, or it doesn't have to be 45 degrees. I mean, 45 is where we see metals fail. We see, uh, we see uh, a dislocation slip along these, and then it, it narrows down uh, in the middle. But Yeah, so the, the real thing about more circle that makes it useful is that it gives you a uh, shortcut for doing math. And the equation we got for the circle, for the circle shape, yeah. is it applicable for any type of material, any type of yeah. dislocation, so anything, so we yeah. didn't we, assume we, we, anything at the beginning. Yep, yeah, we, we, we derived this for uh, just a homogeneous uh, material. So sigma one two at the <clears throat> at the more circle on the left more left get yeah, there. Yeah. That's equal to what? Sigma one. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, equal to the principal stress because if, if I if I know it's a circle and I know that the radius is and I know the center of the circle is at zero because the uh, I said that the P one and P two are equal. Yeah. Then that tells me that if I rotate it that the, uh, uh, I know that the maximum shear stress is equal to the same stress as here. Makes sense, we just could read this. Oh yeah, yeah. And then yeah. for I3, should that be two instances of uh, sigma 2, 3 squared? Because you get sigma 1, 1 times 2, 3 squared. Oh, uh, so it's, it's 1, 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, Ah, this should, I think it's supposed to be one, three. Let me double check that. Yeah, one. One, one, two, three, one, one. Yeah, two, 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 one, three, 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 one, two. Yeah, so that one's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so more circles is great because you can do a bunch of math, or you can look at pictures. And not everything is, is, is uh, easy in Morse circle, but there's a lot of things that just on the fly, you can get a gut feeling for when it should be. Homogeneous strain. This is the case where uh, you actually get strain accumulation in the body uh, differently. Uh, 
so I'm saying that we're, we're thinking about this elastic body. Our bodies always seem to be amoeba of some type. Uh, and then within that, we have a little cuboid. In a cuboid, a little more cubic. Is bounded by x, x so I call it x1, x1 plus delta x1, uh, and then x2, x2 plus delta x2, and then in the vertical direction, uh, x3 and x3 plus delta x3. And we want to talk about the accumulation going across that due to there being a, a stress gradient. And uh, I'll try to get the notation right here. I know that in my notes I, I tend to slip between full notation and, and void notation. Uh, but we'll do the best we can. So. Uh, in, in this volume, uh, we can talk about there being a difference in the stress on, say, the left and the right side by, say, some delta sigma 1, 1, delta x, 1, and that would be some sigma 1, 1 at x minus delta x, 1, minus sigma 1, 1 at x1 over x1 minus delta x1 minus x1. All right, so it's basically the uh, uh, difference in the strain on the left and the right side, sorry, difference in the stress on the left and the right side due to the difference in the position and in the infinitesimal limit that gives us a d sigma 1, 1, dx 1. Um, now, if we look at that, we've got force per area per length, or uh, force per volume. Uh, so the contribution of sigma 1, 1 on F1 force, we can get by uh, getting rid of the volume. So, per, per. and then just to get that as, as a force, we will take and multiply it by delta V. And that will get rid of the, the volume component and just leave force. So we can talk about the contribution of the 1, 1 stress on the force in the one face. And this will also be sigma 1, 1, D, sigma 1, delta X. So that means that we've got forces, and we can write the forces in the one direction as d sigma 1, 1, dx 1, plus d sigma 2, 1, dx 2, plus d sigma 3, 1, dx 3, delta v, because the force in the one direction due to the uh, 
three components of the stresses multiplied by the volume, the infinitesimal uh, volume, and that will give us the force in the one direction. And similarly, F2, F3. And you can write those out as well. I'm not going to just uh, transpose them. But <clears throat> from those, the gap is equal to 1, F2, F3. So we got the force then as a vector. And it's a vector which is a, uh, let, me, let me write this out in uh, Einstein notation, right? We want the, the uh, I is equal to B sigma J I over X, J, delta V. So this, this would give us the components of our force vector. But the force vector also, uh, we know from Newton's uh, law, that F is equal to mass times acceleration, which is mass times the curvature, or the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time. Which means that we can take these and these and combine them to get, I want to erase this, get m d squared u1 delta v t squared is equal to uh, rho d squared u e t squared is equal to d sigma 1, 1, d x 1 plus d sigma 2, 1, d x 2 plus d sigma 3, 1, d x 3. So this is the density. This is the mass divided by the volume. And this gives us uh, one component, but then we have the other two components as well. <clears throat> so we can write in Einstein notation, uh, rho is equal to d squared ui dt squared is equal to D sigma J I D X J. So that gives us three equations that relate the uh, displacement as a function of time and the uh, force. Why wouldn't it be row times? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, row times. So we've got three equations that give us that now. Um, and this, I'll, I'll write this up here, uh, rho d squared u So this equation is true for uh, all material, 
and the next step I'm going to take is to substitute in uh, a value for sigma. And for that, I'm going to skip and just use cubic. But you should recognize that if you want a non-cubic material, you basically go through and follow the derivation that I'm doing, but you put in other, other values. Or I should say, uh, you put in the other elastic constants. <clears throat> So if we assume <coughs> cubic uh, symmetry, then that gives us the sigma one one dx one equal to d by d x one c one one. 1, 1, epsilon 1, 1, plus C, 1, 2, oh, sorry, 1, 1, 2, 2, epsilon 2, 2, plus C, 1, 1, 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3, we get D sigma 2, 1, dx, 2 is equal to d by dx 2 of c 2, 3, 2, 3, epsilon 2, 1. And we get derivative of epsilon 3, 1 with respect to direction 3 is equal to d dx 3 c Two, three, two, three, epsilon, three, one. So we take these and we substitute those up into our expressions, and that allows us to write. that long hand might as well change colors though so that we might get a different color smudge on the board. Epsilon one one plus C one one two two epsilon one epsilon two two plus C one one two two epsilon three three plus derivative with respect to x two C two three two three epsilon two one plus D by dx. 3, C, 2, 3, 2, 3, epsilon, 3, 1. Then becomes C, 1, 1, 1, 1, D, epsilon, 1, 1, by D, X, 1, plus C, 1, 1, 2, 2, D epsilon 2, 2 by D x 1 plus D epsilon 3, 3 divided by D x 1 plus C 2, 3, 2, 3 D epsilon 2, 1 by D x 2 plus D epsilon 3, 1 by dx 3. 
Okay. So we got those, but in order to solve this, we have to substitute epsilon i j terms of u i j. Right? We need to get the arbitrary script to say u. Well. Of du dx, right? That was our definition of uh, stresses and strains. Or just our definition of strains. So we have the derivative of e11 with respect to x1 is equal to d by dx1 du1 by dx1. We have d epsilon to 2 by dx1 is equal to d by d, uh, x1 du2 by dx2. d epsilon 3, 3 by dx1 equal to d by dx1 of d u3 by dx3. Got those three. And then we also have to get the uh, two cross terms here as well. And our cross terms are d epsilon 2, 1 by dx2 is equal to d by dx2 of 1 half e12 plus e21. Remember, these were our uh, engineering stress strains. And then we have engineering stress strains written in terms of the displacements. So this is d dx2 1 half du1 by dx2 plus du2 by dx1. And in a similar fashion, we have d epsilon 3 1 by dx3 is equal to d by dx3, one half, du1 by dx3 plus du3 by dx1. So that gives us our strains uh, translated into displacements. And at the end of the day, we then take these, substitute them into this expression, and we will get and like this. to C1111, D squared U1 by D X1 squared, plus C2323 divided by 2, multiplied by the second derivative of U1 with respect to X2, plus the second derivative of u1 with x3, right from there, 
plus uh, C1122 plus C2323 divided by 2 multiplied by D squared U DX1 DX2 plus D squared U DX1 dx3. So that gives us one equation, uh, and then we have two others. Sorry, there's one here. There's one here too. Uh, so it's just the first component of the displacement. See if I can find a shortcut for writing this out. This is so I these use a two and a three. out is because this is the punchline. This is the, the, final, the final set of equations, and those three equations are what we solve to determine the 
inhomogeneous uh, distribution of stresses and strains. So uh, I've got an example of how to, how to use these. Example I, I wanted to give was an example of passing an elastic wave through a material, like a sound wave. And we can write this elastic wave, uh, we can have a functional form to it, is this. of position and time, this R as position, so it's, it's, a, it's a vector quantity, uh, that, and there's a dot, it's a dot relation. This is the wave vector. wave vector tells us the direction that the wave is propagating, and it tells us about the wavelength. So, and the amplitude of k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength. We have time, and here we have angular frequency. So this is just a plane wave uh, that's passing through a, through a material. And Point out here that, that what we what we're doing is, is we're taking and uh, we're going to substitute this known waveform, this known displacement, and uh, solve uh, this equation to understand the relationships between. The internal workings of this plane wave. So let, let's let's uh, let's consider a plane wave traveling. Let's say it's going in the uh, uh, one one zero direction. So. By doing this, it's going to simplify the math because now we only have to deal with a scalar quantity, right? We've gotten rid of uh, we've gotten rid of the, the vectorized parts. Uh, so when we solve this, we're actually going to get three different waves out. We're going to get a, a wave that's traveling, and that's our, our x direction that is traveling like this, and then a wave that's traveling this way, and and this way. So we've got a longitudinal wave, and then we've got transverse waves. And those are going to be the three solutions to this problem. So let's, let's do the longitudinal wave first. Uh, in the case of the longitudinal wave, in the case of the longitudinal wave, uh, U1 is equal to U10 x 
of k i k x1 minus omega t. So that's our displacement uh, in this direction as a function of time and position. And we only have position in the x direction because we only have to think longitudinal. When we think uh, transverse, then we're going to have to think in the uh, uh, x2 and x3 directions as well. So we take this, and in order to substitute this back into these equations, we have to uh, take the derivatives. So we have d squared u1 dt squared is equal to negative i omega squared u1 is equal to negative omega squared u1. So that's the time derivative. Uh, spatial derivatives, d u1 dx1 is equal to i k u1. Second derivative, u1 dx1 squared squared is equal to negative k squared u1. So the second derivative of that, i, remember, square root of negative 1. Um, and in the other directions, because we always have cross terms, in the other directions, uh, du1 dx2 equals du2 dx3 is equal to 0. So we can take these four and substitute them into here for u1. And we will get lots of zeros. Uh, in fact, the whole thing simplifies down to rho negative omega squared u1 is equal to c1111 one, 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 negative k squared u1. Or um, omega squared rho is equal to k squared c1111. One, 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 which is kind of handy. Uh, but we can make this more useful because we also know what the velocity is. We know that the velocity of the wave is equal to the frequency of the wave times the wavelength. Right? So that makes sense because it's, you know, meters per second. So it's the velocity. Uh, but we can translate that into uh, the angular frequency and into k by, by recognizing that we can uh, write this as 2 pi nu omega over 2 pi. So we multiply and divide by 2 pi at the same time. And that gives us omega over So that means that then we can use this and this to write that the velocity of the wave is equal to the square root of omega squared over k squared is equal to the square root of c1111 over So, uh, 
right, so on the scoreboard up here. So the velocity of sound as this longitudinal wave in a material only depends on the 1, 1, 1 monoelastic constants and the rho for the density if you're going in the uh, 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 x direction only. Because if, if you change the direction, that's going to change as well. And it's independent of the the uh, wavelength, right? It only depends on it only depends on the con the uh, elastic properties of the material. Now let's do the transverse waves. Transverse components, we get uh, u two is equal to u two not x i a x one minus omega t. So we have this x1 in here. And remember, that's because k is a vector. So we're taking k0, 0, 0, dotting into x1, x2, x3. So, uh, but it's still a scalar in, in what we're writing out. e squared u2. Et is equal to negative omega squared u2. Okay. Um, and d squared. Wait, I'm missing something here. Oh, I didn't. I just skipped a step. And. Uh, Which means that omega rho is equal to k squared c two three two three over two, or the trans is equal to square root of c two three two three over. And that's the next solution. And this kind of makes sense because what we're seeing is that the longitudinal wave has to do with the ability to compress the material and the transverse wave frequency has to do with the shear uh, elastic constant, right? Because that's the uh, uh, off-diagonal terms of our elastic matrix. So I'll do one more example. Uh, in, in this one, they, they get the, uh, it shows it moving from the uh, X direction to off X direction, the coupling becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, I wanted to show K equals K, K 
zero. So something in the one, one, zero direction. Uh, and I just scaled it by the letter K, and I'm saying it, it's, it's uh, cubic, for one thing, and it's traveling in a... Uh, uh, with some amplitude k. So in this case, it's easier to start with a transverse wave. Um, and we get u3 equals not x i of k1 x1 plus k2 x2 and minus omega t. So we're going to make the assumption that these two are equals at one point, but for now we'll start out by saying that we have a, a different, uh, uh, they're, they're not necessarily in the 1, 1, 1 direction, but they're uh, in the plane, of in the xy plane. So we get uh, a k1 and a k2 there. Uh, which gives us omega squared rho is equal to c two three two three over two k one squared plus k two squared equal to c two three two three over two k squared. So this is, is, if I take these two to be equal, then I wind up with a k squared there. So I get the trans to c2323 over 2 rho. So that's very similar to what we had before. That is identical. Uh, and now the other terms, though the ones that are in the xy plane, uh, the solutions become coupled. So we wind up having to solve, uh, so we just solved this equation, now we've got to solve the first <coughs> two equations simultaneously. So that going to entail setting it up, uh, finding a matrix, and then uh, solving for the eigen, uh, eigenvalues. So the equations are u1 equals u1 not x i k1 x1 plus k2 x2 minus omega t, and u2 is equal to u2 naught x i k1 x1 plus k2 x2 minus omega t. And that's this is why they get coupled, because they have the, these terms in the exponentials. Substituting into here and simplifying, we get. I'm trying to write this somewhat small. Omega squared rho u one is equal to c one 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 k one squared plus c two three two three over two k2 squared u1 plus c1122 plus c2323 over 2 k1 k2 u2. So we get one equation, and then the next equation, uh, the order changes. So we get omega squared rho u2 
2 is equal to C 1, 1, 1, 1, K 2 plus C 2, 3, 2, 3 over 2, K 1 squared U 2 plus C 1, 1, 2, 2 plus C 2, 3, 2, 3 over 2, K 1, K 2, U 1. And because the order changes like that, and because we have our frequencies out here in front, that means that we can write this as uh, an eigenvalue problem. And we wind up with a problem that looks like this. C 1, 1, 1, 1. K1 squared C2, 3, 2, 3 over 2, K2 squared minus omega rho, omega squared rho. C1, 1, 1, 2, 2 plus C. 2, 3, 2, 3 over 2, K1, K2, C1, 1, 1, 2, 2 plus C2, 3, 2, 3 over 2, K1, K2, and then bottom right, C1, 1, 1, 1, 1, K1 squared plus C2, 3, 2, 3 over 2, K2 squared minus omega rho times U1, U2 equals 0. So it's become an eigenvalue problem. So these are going to be our eigenvalues. Square. And those are going to be the eigenvectors associated with them. And when we solve the eigenvalues, we get well, I'm going to have to change the colors. Now this seems to solve everything. Uh, get omega squared rho is equal to k2 over 2 c1111 one, 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 one minus c1122 one, one, two, two. and omega squared rho is equal to k squared over 2 C1111 one, 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 one plus C1122 one, one, two, two plus C2323. Two, three, two, three. So the solutions are, are actually fairly different. Uh, this has an eigenvector. of minus 1 plus 1 and this solution has the eigenvector plus 1 plus 1. Now So what this physically means is it physically means that if I've got my x1 and x2 plane and I'm traveling in the 1-1 one, one direction, that the displacements at any given time 
if it has this set of eigen this set of this uh, eigenvalue, then it will be uh, minus x plus y, which means that it has a net factor that does that. It corresponds to this. That is solution one. This is solution two corresponds to plus x plus y. So you have a net vector here, which means that's what it's doing. This is our longitudinal, and this is our transverse. And if we take and we substitute, we get the trans is equal to square root of C1111 minus C1122 over to rho and the longitudinal is equal to square root of C1111 plus C1122 plus C2323 over to rho. So the fact that the different wave modes have different velocities, and those velocities depend on the elastic constants. Uh, this is why if you're measuring the elastic constants, one thing you can do is you can get a transducer, and you can uh, use a transducer and a receiver and measure uh, the waves propagating. <laughs>